Okay, let's get started. Hopefully you've enjoyed staring at this for a bit. We'll come back to it in a moment. First of all, course announcements. Uh, hopefully you are all here deliberately for the second lecture of 761, which is Mathematical Tools for Computer Science. Um, this particular class is going to be on proofs. This particular day is going to be on proofs and how to solve problems. Uh, let's start out with some course announcements. First of all, we have a fantastic TA. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, can people hear me? Can hear you, great. Okay, uh, hello. Uh, I'm in my third year of grad school at McGill. Uh, I did my undergrad in math and my research is about 50% theory, so I'm, I'm quite used to, to proofs. Uh, I'm looking forward to being your TA and meeting all of you and helping you guys learn proofs. Awesome. And are these your tentative office hours? Yeah, uh, those are good for me. Um, if those don't work for other people, then they can change. Uh, I don't have any courses this semester, so my schedule it has like quite a lot of flexibility. Um, but for now, let's, let's go with 11 to 12 on Thursdays. Great. If you're one of those persnickety people um, who, who looks at 12 a.m. and says that's not noon, it's 11 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern time on Thursdays, to clarify. That is not midnight office hours. Um, sorry about that. So other course announcements. Um, there will be a Slack workspace, which um, I will invite you all to join for class discussions and like more announcements and stuff. I'll try to send those out by email as well, but it'll be really helpful to be able to have a place where you can just chat. Um, and also that isn't um, limited to people who have access to the My Courses page. Um, in terms of uh, next things to expect, problem set one should be released on Tuesday and it will be due two weeks from today, which is Friday, September 18th. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions about any of this or anything else regarding the course? Please post in the chat or unmute yourself. I was just wondering for those of us who are auditing, uh, would you be willing to release the assignments or do you prefer to keep those to the actual people taking the class? No, absolutely. Anyone auditing, um, the official auditors are expected to complete the assignments and you will absolutely have access to them as soon as they are, as soon as they are ready. Okay, uh, great. Um, for, for those who would like to watch this class but aren't going to be participating in the assignments, then I can share the recordings with you, but I would ask that you don't participate live since this is a discussion-based course. And anyone is welcome to audit if they are submitting the assignments because that's how you can be most active in the discussion. I think it's otherwise not fair to the people who are participating in the discussion. But yeah. um, any more questions? There's one more question. Is there a right way to do the problem sets or is any valid solution okay? Any valid solution is okay. There is no, in, in fact, you can get bonus points for, for being super creative. Like if you come up with a solution that we've never thought of before, then that's super awesome. Um, unless it's, it's because it's like 200 pages long, then it's, then it will, then it will, you will get full credit, but it will make us unhappy because we'll have to read 200 pages. Um, will there be any extra course materials posted somewhere? Um, the course materials probably will be these slides um, in both the PDF and the LaTeX source code, um, recordings from the classes and the problem sets. I'm not expecting there to be other course materials. They might show up, but certainly you're not, you're, I'm, not I'm not expecting to have like a, a huge set of notes or something like that. Anything else? Okay, let's dive right on in. So that problem, for those who came a little bit early, um, and in general, I will post a teaser problem at the start of class, which will be relevant for the rest of class. So if you come here before 405, you get to look at it before, you get to look at it for a bit longer. Um, the problem, you'd like to travel from your work 
point A to your house, point B, stopping off at some point along the river. And the river is just a line because we're in math land and everything's just simple. Um, to gather water. Um, so you're, you need to go somewhere to, to the river and then you need to go to point B. What's an algorithm for finding the shortest total distance you have to travel? Um, just let you think about that for a moment. I realize most of you have already thought about it for some minutes. Um, so do we have any ideas here? There was already some ideas posted in the chat. So somebody suggested Dijkstra. This might be overkill. Um, you can, yes, you can take the derivative of the sum of two distances um, and you can set that to zero. So first of all, what roughly is this going to look like? like rough, roughly, what is your path? Like, what, what, do you, what is, is it going to be? It's clearly not going to be a straight line from A to B because you then don't pass across the river. What, what, is, what is this going to look like? Uh, feel free to post in the chat. Yeah, there's going to be some kind of there's going to be some kind of triangle. Sorry, I, I think it's just going to be a bit fast paced. So let's post in the chat. Um, um, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be like you're going to go go up to the line and then you go go and go down to B. So there's going to be some point P on the line that you travel to and then you travel to B. But you need to find out what that point is. And so somebody's been point people have been pointing out that you can differentiate. You can write the distance from A to P and then from P to B. And then you can work out what the minimum is. And yeah, you can do this with calculus. But uh, there, there, there are a couple of people who are saying reflect B. Um, and I like this. Um, so let's take a look at this picture. This is what happens if you reflect B across the line. So for those who haven't seen uh, the, the term reflection, reflection just means that this other point is the mirror image of B in the, in the um, mirror that is the line. So this is a perpendicular line to the line, a per perpendicular to L, and the distance from this point to the line is the same as B to the line. This is the, that's what the reflection of B is. And so then what do we do with this? Well, according to the suggestion, you can connect these two points and there's a straight line. Why is this point interesting? Why do we like that point? People can post in the chat. It's the shortest, so this is the shortest distance between, the line is the shortest distance between any two points. So the distance from A to this point is um, the same as the, you know, the, 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 this, this path is the shortest distance between A and this point. Why is, why is this relevant to B? Why does this, why, why is this point special? Ah, yeah, so by symmetry, the distance from this point to B is the same as the distance from this point to its mirror image. That means that the total distance you travel from here to here is the same as the total distance from here to here. And since this straight line is the shortest distance between this point and this point, this is the point on the river that you have to travel to. This is the point P. Okay. If you didn't get all of that, that's because what I didn't do was actually give you a proof. What we were just doing here was sort of thinking about how to solve a problem. That is not a solution. So if you don't get all bits of it, that's because I didn't actually give you a solution. We're gonna come back to this in a moment and we're gonna actually prove it. This is just sort of an intuition for why it's true. So what is a proof? A mathematical proof is a set of logical steps that explains why an answer is true. And there are several reasons why you might be interested in one of these proofs. First, you might want to convince someone else. If you're trying to explain why an answer is true, I mean, the obvious reason why you'd be doing that is because somebody is like, I don't think it's true. And you want to tell them why it is true. And you want to give them a set of logical steps that will convince them as well. But also you want to convince yourself sometimes. Like sometimes you're not sure why something is true 
And you sort of have an intuition for why it's true, but sometimes it's a bit fuzzy. And when you try to write it down, it doesn't actually hold together clearly, or you, you haven't really convinced yourself that you didn't like leave out some edge case where it's just not true. So the structure of a mathematical proof is also designed to convince you that something's true and that there aren't any gaps or mistakes in, in your reasoning. Sometimes it can also provide more insight into what's going on just by writing down the proof and sort of going through the process of thinking about what would go into the proof that can help you to understand what the key insights are in the problem. And that can help you even beyond solving that particular problem, you might be able to solve more problems um, or understand the general area that this problem is coming from. Um, you can think in general of an answer as something short often. So like, for example, you know, if somebody gives you a problem and you're like, the answer is two, that's an answer. But a proof is like this and this and this and this and this, this means that the answer is two. And we'll go into a lot more detail on this. But that's just the basic idea of what a proof is designed to do. Now, in this course, you will be expected to provide proofs on the problem sets. Most of the problems in the problem sets will be proof based. Not all of them, probably. Um, and as somebody asked before, there isn't one right way to solve the problems on the problem sets. Any explanation that is a proper proof will do. And there are often many ways to solve a problem. There are basically always many ways to solve a problem. That's the beauty of math. When something's true, it's just true. And so there are many ways to get there. Now in class, sometimes we will do full proofs and I'm gonna do full proofs today and try to do some more over the coming days. Um, sometimes we will not be giving full proofs because sometimes full proofs just take a long time. And sometimes I'll be providing sort of intuitions for why something is true. For example, if the proof is very hard and I wanna you know, tackle the, the difficult part, but sort of leave some of the details out. And sometimes I won't be proving things at all because we might just want to know something and not prove it. But um, it's useful, you know, one of the, the motivations for looking at proofs, even when we're not always doing the proofs, is so that we can sort of understand what the proofs would look like, even if we don't always go through it. And I know that I personally, as a mathematician, find this really useful that I can imagine often how one might go about doing a proof and that will enable me to think about the problem the right way. And if I need to write down a proof, then I can try to work out exactly what a proof would look like. So even if I'm not going to be writing down the proof, even though there's no need for it, it's still really useful, I think, to understand what a proof does look like. So with all that in mind for like why one would be interested in proofs, both in general and also, you know, for the particular exigencies of this course, um, some tips on how to write proofs, like how does one do this thing? And then we'll see some examples. So first, indicate how you are making each conclusion. This is probably the biggest thing to remember in writing a proof. Just explain how you get from one place to the next place. Um, an example of this doing this well is like combining equations one and five, assuming you've numbered your equations one and five. You don't always have to number your equations, but if you want to reference them later, it's often good to number them. Combining equations one and five, we find that x equals y plus one. A bad example, this is not how you should do it, is just saying we get x equals y plus one without indicating where that came from. I can't tell you how many times I read that, even in like official published papers, and I'm like, I don't know where that came from. So these are, tips are definitely violated by like professional computer scientists and mathematicians all the time. Um, don't be like, don't be like the, the, the bad examples here. Um, this is also really useful because sometimes you can accidentally assume what you're trying to prove. So spelling out explicitly why you're getting something is really useful for making sure you're not accidentally assuming the thing that you desperately want to show. Um, and we'll come back to this in a, in, a, in a bit later when I'm talking about thinking backwards in order to solve the problem. So the second tip is defining new things clearly. This is just like in code. If you have a thing, if you have an object, it's often good to name it and name it explicitly. Don't name it implicitly. So one example could be like, let M be the right-hand side of the previous equation. Then the algorithm runs in time O of N plus M, where N is the number of bits in the input. That, that doesn't necessarily make any sense, but it at least makes mathematical sense. Um, 
A bad example would be just to say the algorithm runs in time O of n plus the right hand side, where you don't know what n is, you sort of have to work it out. Um, and the right hand side, ugh, you shouldn't really be referencing things by like long descriptions of, of you know, what is the, it's the right hand side of what? The previous equation, the one before, like spelling things out is really useful uh, to make sure that other people are understanding where you're coming from. You can, uh, to, to, to um, uh, respond to a question, you, are, you should feel free to ask questions at any point during the lecture. Probably easiest do, to ask questions during the chat because that's sort of least invasive. Um, but please ask questions at absolutely any point. Um, and also feel free to make comments too. This should be a discussion. Uh, it's kind of hard to do an, a, an online discussion, but yeah, I'm trying. Um, so next tip, use words in addition to equations. And this is something that I actually see a lot, right? Like when, when someone's sort of first starting to, to write proofs, it's really natural to think that mathematicians sort of just write in symbols. And that is not the best way to do things. Like here's a bad example of this, like X equals Y squared, Y equals Z squared, arrow X equals Z to the fourth. And while I can sort of understand what's going on there, it's really hard to read. And just because there's math involved it doesn't mean that I don't like speak in words or think in words. So try to write incomplete sentences like because x equals y squared and y equals z squared, we have x equals z to the fourth. Much more readable. It makes it much more clear what the conclusion is and what the, the, the reasons for that conclusion are. And just in general, think about writing incomplete sentences and just using your equations within those sentences. Obviously, symbols and equations are extremely useful. They just should be you know, used within normal human language. Another thing, remember to break into paragraphs. This is surprisingly hard to remember. Sometimes you're just typing and typing and you realize that you have this immense block of text. Uh, this is particularly easy to do in LaTeX, actually, because sometimes spaces don't fully render in LaTeX unless you make, make a new paragraph deliberately. So make a new paragraph deliberately. Otherwise, you can get something that's really hard to read. Remember that people are reading proofs. Proofs are not something to be read by computers. They're to be read by other people. And if you've ever had, if you've ever looked at a bunch of math and been like, oh my gosh, that's so much math, you don't want to be the person creating that math. It's far easier to create something incomprehensible than it is to create, than it is to um, decode um, something uh, that, that's incomprehensible. Um, I'll get to the question in a moment. Um, style of proof writing. There is a particular style which you will sort of get to learn. It's a sort of concise and formal style. There are various kinds of language that are typically associated with proofs. I don't really know why. One of them is using we instead of I or you. So don't, you, you don't have to say like, I define this to be. You can say, we define this to be. In general, the, you know, the pronouns are not the most important thing, but having a concise style and ideally a formal style is pretty good. So for example, squaring both sides of the equation, we obtain this. You sometimes get very enthusiastic proofs, which are like, what happens if you square both sides of the equation? You get this. And I quite understand where that's coming from. You just like, it's sort of stream of consciousness. This is how you did it. And you want to communicate that. You don't actually have to do stream of consciousness and you don't have to appeal to the reader personally. And you don't have to exactly explain what your thinking was in terms of coming up with the proof. You just have to explain how the logical steps hold together. So you can say, you know, we squared both sides of the equation. This is what happened. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to, to be a story exactly. Uh, is there a recommended verb tense? Um, I generally do present tense. So I, I wouldn't do we squared both sides of the equation. I would do we square both sides of the equation to get. Or rather than, it, you shouldn't do like we, we squared both sides and we got to this. So yeah, present tense, I guess. Um, figures are fantastic 
a picture is worth a thousand words. That's totally true for proofs as for most other things. Um, if you're writing proofs in LaTeX, you don't have to create your figures in LaTeX for this course. I think I already said that. Um, if you're writing a solution to a problem set, even if you need a picture, feel free to draw that picture in some other way. You know, even it might be neater not to do it by hand, but if you have to do it by hand, you can do it by hand and scan it in, and that's still better than, than not having a picture. Um, but do remember, it's very easy to write, to draw a picture, but not define things in the picture. Um, sorry, not define things except in the picture. You should not have anything in the figure that isn't defined also outside the figure. So for example, if there's a point P in your figure, even if it's very clear, seemingly, what it is, you should say, in figure one, point P is the intersection of segment AB with line L. Or we define point P to be the intersection of segment AB with line L, something like that. You should never rely upon the figure to define something for you. And then final point, if your approach is complicated, describe it and break it up. And so this is, an, this is an example of what that might look like. So for so here, there's gonna be some fairly complicated proof and you wanna sort of indicate how you're going to go about it. So you're, you can say, we will prove the result by induction. Next class, we're gonna talk about what induction is, but that's just basically a style of proving things. Dividing into three cases, according to whether A is positive, negative, or zero. We begin by proving the following claim. Claim, B is even, proof of claim. Now notice what I've done here. I've taken a statement that will be useful and I have separated it into a, a separate part. Some people call this a lemma. So you could call it a claim or a lemma or you know, even a proposition if you wanna be really fancy. But you, know, if you don't have to worry about propositions and theorems really here. Um, but if, you, if this is like a separate thing, make it be a separate thing. Say what you're gonna to try to prove, prove that thing, and then come back to the main thing, saying, having proven the claim, we proceed to our three cases. And then break out your three cases, specify them exactly. Case one, A is greater than zero. Proof in case one, blah, blah, blah. Then go to case two, A is less than zero. Proof of case two, and so on. Um, and so there was, a, there was a, 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 a question in the chat. Do we distinguish between a corollary theorem or lemma and by how it's proven? Basically, no. Corollaries, theorems, and lemmas all need to be proven, and I wouldn't say that they're distinguished really by how they're proven. Theorems, uh, so, oh, oh, and Vincent already, already um, uh, answered that, so thank you so much, um, and completely seconded what you say. Um, okay, so having gone through all of, all of that, um, oh, and was there something else I, I wanted to, to indicate here. Um, never mind. Um, so let's go back to let's go back to this problem we were looking at. Um, remember, we were trying to find this point P such that A P plus B P is, is minimized. So how would we actually write a formal proof of this? Here's an example. This is the, the start of the proof. It'll take a few few slides. Um, and this is probably more detailed than you actually need in the proof. I'm just trying to be really, really rigorous. So going into all the, in, into all the, 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 the details to make sure it's completely clear, hopefully. So to start out, the problem didn't say we needed to find a point P. So we need to say our goal is to find some point P. To minimize the distance traveled, it is optimal to travel from A to some point P along L and then from P to B. We therefore must find the point P on L such that AP plus BP is minimized. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Sort of another key point is turn a problem with, with words into a problem with sort of, it, with formal statements. So that's, that's useful. Now, remember we had this reflection idea. So let B prime, it's important to name everything, to define everything. Let B prime be the reflection of point B across line L. And you know, again, this, you probably wouldn't have to write this parenthetical if uh, in, in a formal proof, this is just explaining what a reflection is. Um, that is B, B prime is perpendicular to L and B and B prime are equidistant from L. That's just the definition of a reflection. Uh, as shown in the figure, it's always important to reference your figure. If you have a figure there, remember that the person doesn't necessarily know to look at it at a certain point. So say, this is a good time to look at the figure. Let, Q, uh, let uh, Q be the intersection of B, B prime with L. So this is another point. Remember, define the points in the body of the text. 
We didn't define P exactly, but that's because we're not going to use P. So now there is a, a, a subsidiary result we will find useful. So let's state that explicitly and break it out into a claim or a lemma, if you like. Claim for any point P on L, the distance B prime P equals the distance B P. So there are many ways to prove this. In fact, it's, 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 some, it's somewhat of a, a basic fact of, of reflections. So in a real, in a formal proof, you might not even need to prove this, but I'm just gonna prove it for the sake of completeness. So how would you go about proving that this, the distance from P to B is the same as the distance from P to B prime? You can do it, for example, by the Pythagorean theorem. You can say that by the Pythagorean theorem on right triangle PQB, BP squared equals PQ squared plus BQ squared. That's just what the Pythagorean theorem says here. And we know it's a right triangle because we defined it to be a right triangle. We defined this line to be perpendicular to this. Now, similarly, there's another right triangle here and we get B prime P squared is equal to P Q squared plus B prime Q squared. Notice that I can say similarly. Similarly is very useful. Sometimes you, you, will, you will find yourself using the same argument multiple times with sort of slight variations indicating similarly, or in some cases you can say by symmetry, here it's not really by symmetry, um, but indicate that it'll help it be a readable proof. Um, so we have these two equations and you can say combining these two equations and using the fact that B prime Q equals BQ, remember we, we defined it to be that, we conclude that BP equals B prime P proving the claim. And that's because this is just equal to this. So this is equal to this. So this proves the claim. It doesn't prove our result. See a couple of questions here. Um, great. Um, now, since B prime P, we're moving back to our main result that we're trying to prove. Now, since B prime P is equal to BP uh, because of the claim for any P, we know that minimizing AP plus BP is equivalent to minimizing AP plus B, B prime P. Since a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, the optimum is attained where P is the intersection of A, B prime with L. Thus, remember, we have to go back and actually say what it was that we were trying to show. Thus, our algorithm, which was what we were asked for here, is to reflect B across L to B prime and to take the intersection of A, B prime with L. And then there's this little uh, black square. Uh, there are various variations on this. Some people use QED. Uh, often, often you'll see a black square or an empty square uh, called a halmus, uh, named after a mathematician called uh, halmus, um, that indicates that the proof is over. Any questions about that? The uniqueness of the solution is obvious here, but should we also formally prove it? We actually did prove it. It is equivalent to minimize. It, it, we, we sort of glossed over it a bit. Um, you could, if you wanted, this is a really good point. Sometimes there's a uniqueness proof which is necessary. Since a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, you could say since a straight line is the unique shortest distance between two points, if you wanted. Um, should we also write proofs of theorems in the presentation style tech file or just tech file? Um, you will have a, um, there, will, there will be a, um, a template. I will give you a, a LaTeX template to use for solutions. So you shouldn't write it in Beamer, which is this, this way to create slides. Don't, don't make slides out of it, make it an actual text. It was actually a real pain to separate a proof into slides. So definitely don't try to do that because proofs shouldn't be for slides. They should be for you know, whole pages. Okay, let's move on. Do we have to submit in LaTeX? Um, that was answered in the previous class, yes, for every problem set except the first one, but there are guides in the slides from the first class on how to learn LaTeX and LaTeX itself will not be graded, but you have to submit in LaTeX. Go to the previous uh, class to, 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 to uh, hear more about that. Okay, let's see another example. How many people have seen the Monty Hall problem? People raising hands? Okay, cool. Okay, so let's see, I mean, this is the goal of this is a formal proof of the Monty Hall problem, which will be very brief. Um, so the Monty Hall problem, you were in a game show where you can win a prize. There are three doors. Behind two of them are goats. Behind the third is a car. Assume for this problem that you want a car more than a goat. Uh, you might possibly want a goat, but in this problem, you definitely want to get the car. You pick a door at random because you don't have any information. Um, and then the host, so since there are two goats, 
the host can always pick another one of the doors, open it, and reveal a goat, because there's always some other goat. So you might think, well, I didn't get any more information. You can either stick with your original choice or switch to the other one. Which is better? What is, what is the answer here? Switch. The, the switches have it. You should, you should switch to the other door. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, intuitively it feels, like, I, I, I know when I first heard this, it was really confusing to me, like, because the host can always reveal another goat, why should you switch? And there are various intuitive explanations for why this is the case. I'm not actually going to focus on an intuitive explanation right now, though hopefully this is somewhat intuitive, but this is like a formal proof in just a few lines of why, why you should do this. Um, so first, wh what's the rough way you might organize this? Um, how might you organize this, 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 this proof? Always good to think about how you're gonna organize a proof. Um, so yes, there'll be probability involved. Um, what, is a, what is a good way to sort of frame it and organize it? Are there gonna be tons of lemmas? Are grid of possible solutions, yeah, different cases. There are various different ways. You can imagine doing it in a grid, you could do it in, in cases. So I, yeah, two cases you switch or you don't. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do two slightly different cases. And two, two cases to be considered, either the initial pick was right, or the initial pick was wrong. Um, but you, there are other ways to, to, to split it, but you probably do wanna do it with cases. So if you're doing it in this, in this way with cases, um, um, the initial pick, case one, is a car. So in this case, clearly you should stay. That is the correct, that is the correct strategy. In case two, the initial pick is a goat. In that case, the remaining door must be the car because there are only two, there are two goats in one car, right? So the, the host, who's Monty Hall, picks the other goat, and so you should definitely switch. So it's optimal to switch in that case. Now, what do you do with these two cases? There's a one-line way to get, the, to get the answer here. How do you finish the proof? Yeah, find how, how likely is it to be each case? So we know that the first case, you should definitely not switch. In the second case, you should definitely switch. So since case one occurs with one third probability, because there are three doors, you might have picked a car with one third probability. Case two occurs with two thirds probability. Two thirds of the time, it's optimal to switch. Therefore, you should switch. This is not necessarily the most intuitive uh, uh, of proofs, but I think it actually provides a pretty, this is, this is actually how I think about the problem. Mm. Um, and I know this is a problem where once you've gotten it, you're like, oh, this is obvious, but until you've gotten it, it isn't obvious at all. But anyway, so this is a formal proof of how you would go, how you go about uh, proving this. Um, let us quickly talk about problem solving itself though. Um, and then we will go to one other and slightly longer problem uh, before finishing. So problem solving tips. Um, it, it, it's hard to write down a list of like how to solve math problems because there isn't one way to solve math problems, but there are good ways to sort of get out of being stuck and just staring blindly at the words. Um, in general, I think writing things down is really good in, and not just like if, if, you, if you have a problem in front of you, staring at it I, I do stare at it for a while, but then I like try to write things down. And some of the things that I try to write down are assumptions and conditions um, and things that might be framed in a non-mathematical way. So um, you know, in, the, in the first problem, writing down that I needed to get to a point P and then to point B. And so I was trying to minimize a certain a sum of distances A P plus B P. Now this is not always easy to do. Sometimes there isn't a clear way to write something down mathematically. And sometimes, actually, this is the important part of solving the problem. Sometimes framing it the right way is half the problem. This is one reason why proofs are really good, because sometimes framing how to think about the problem and what to, how to formalize it or define the, 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 the variables and so on is half the work. But try to write down your assumptions and conditions in a, in a rigorous mathematical way. Next thing, super useful, just 
all over the place. Try out a small example. Not every problem allows you to do this, but really often you can. Um, this is a great situation for trying some code. If you, if you think that it's something you can code up, try a small example. Um, just to play around with it, even if you don't know what you're looking for, just trying that out is really useful. Uh, sometimes you'll just see patterns, which will be really good for actually proving things. Don't get too seduced by those patterns because you're going to still have to prove them. You're going to have to prove that they hold in general. They don't always, they don't just hold for your small example. And sometimes small examples are really um, misleading, right? Like just because something is true for this really small case doesn't mean it's always true, but it's a good way to give you an idea of what you might be looking for. Another thing to do is think backwards. Um, actually, let me, let, me, let me come to a question. Should we always make assumptions in the beginning? By writing down assumptions and conditions mathematically, I meant any assumptions and conditions that are given to you in the problem or that are already there. Um, um, if you, you shouldn't add any more assumptions because that's a, proving a different problem. Like for example, if you had been given that first problem and you're like, I'm just gonna assume that my work and my house are the same point. So A equals B, then I'm just gonna go to the river and I'm gonna go back. That is not okay because it's not proving the overall problem. It's making a stronger assumption. Um, but you can make any, you should formalize any assumptions that are already given to you in the problem. So really good question. Um, yeah, so think backwards from what you want. Make guesses about some intermediate things that might be useful if they're true, and then try to, tr try to prove them. But actually first try to disprove them because generally your intermediate guesses are going to suck or at least mine do. I generally come up with something and I'm like, what if this were true? That would be great. And then I'm like, that is so not true. And it's not true because I could just do this. And yeah. Um, so, but first try to disprove them and then try to prove them. It's sort of like the scientific method. Uh, so if they, if they really resist being disproven, then you can try to prove them. Um, but an important thing is if you're thinking backwards from what you want, make sure that when you're actually writing the proof, you work forwards. You shouldn't say, if we could show this, then we would be done. Generally, you can sort of do it, but it's generally a better idea, a better idea to write forwards, to say, we show this, therefore, th then from this, we show this. Um, even if the way you got to the intermediate step was by going backwards, you should probably write it forwards. Um, that's just because it's easier to read. It's not because there's some like magic rule. Um, and then finally, think about what, what um, information you haven't used yet. So often there'll be some, you'll be, you'll be like halfway through a solution and you're like, you'll sort of hit a wall and you're like, I don't know what to do now. But then you go back to the problem and you're like, oh, I didn't use this assumption. And that's why it's good to write down your assumptions and conditions, by the way. Um, I didn't use this assumption. Maybe that's why I haven't been able to prove it because the assumptions are generally like if, if you're given a problem by somebody else, generally the assumptions are necessary. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're solving a problem in the real world, you might have more assumptions than you need or fewer assumptions than you need. But um, if you haven't used something that seems to be important, then you might want to use them. You might want to use it in the proof. Okay. So those are some tips in general for thinking about, um, about uh, s solutions and how to get there. Let's take a look at a problem. Out of any 1,000 integers, so that's whole numbers, prove that some subset of them sum to a multiple of 1,000. Let's think about this. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Don't post anything yet. There's a question, does the set contain duplicates? Yes, it might contain duplicates. It's not, it's not said that the, um, well, actually, sorry. It's not, it's not said that it is a set. It doesn't matter in this case. Ideally, a problem would have been written in a bit of a clearer way, but yeah, there might be some repeat integers.
can a subset have one element? Uh, yes, it could just have one element. Um, I glossed over something. It cannot have zero elements. You're not looking for the empty set here, or the answer would be trivial. But it could be one of the integers. It could be all of the integers. No, you cannot prove it with just an example. Because you have to show that for every possible set of 1,000, some subset of them, not just for one. Good question. The only situations basically where you can prove things with examples are if you're trying to find out whether something isn't true. If, it's, if it, all you need to show that, is that, it, that it isn't always true is you only need to find one counterexample. But here you have to prove that it's always true. There could be negative values, yes. People want to post ideas. So the suggestion of contradiction, we'll get to that in a couple of classes. Assume that you don't have this property and show that you have to have less than a thousand. So there isn't a quick answer as far as I know. There isn't like a one line answer. Um, what would be a good way to get started given that it seems kind of hard? What's a good strategy to try? Remember, we saw some strategies and what to do when we're stuck. Small examples. Okay. So it's just an induction. It's a good, it's a good thought. Um, we're we're going to get to induction next class, and we actually will not end up needing induction here, but it could be a reasonable thing to do. Small examples. What does it mean to do a small example here? Can we give a counterexample to disprove this? If you can give a counterexample, then sure, you can, this would solve the problem. However, there isn't a counterexample. It's true. Um, a simple set or trying 10? Yeah. So there, you could imagine trying a simple set of 1,000, but I like the idea of trying 10 because if you see something written for 1,000, it's probably not just true for 1,000. It's probably also true for like, 999 or 100 or like many other numbers. Often you could try proving it for something smaller. So maybe you can try out an example. And since a thousand is pretty large, let's try 10 numbers. It might not be true for 10 numbers, but we can see, we can, like it's way easier than trying out listing just a thousand numbers, right? Can we assume it is a sequence? Um, I think you mean like an arithmetic sequence or a geometric sequence. You can't assume that it's one of those. It, it, it is a sequence in the sense that you can enumerate the numbers, but it's not a sequence in the sense that it's any particular sequence. You could replace all numbers with the remainders. Yes, that would, you could certainly do that. It's not really going to help you, I think, with the intuition, but it's a perfectly, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, but let's actually, you know, let's take that idea and fly with it. If we're trying 10 numbers, let's try things that are remainders. So let's try only things between zero and nine inclusive. So maybe we could do that. Shoot, that kind of didn't work. Why doesn't that work? Yeah, we have 10, so we just take 10. Also the sum of all of them is actually divisible by 10. And like one plus nine is 10, two plus eight is 10. Ugh, so, so many, so many tens there. Um, so we could, we could, how can we do this like, we could do it harder? Like maybe we should try like adding things, like how could, how, could, how could we create something that's a bit harder? Because we don't want to have an easy example. We can try to break it. I mean, I like the idea of trying to come up with a counter example and seeing why we can't. Only odd numbers. I like that idea. That wasn't actually what I, unfortunately, since I have slides here, I can't go out and try something else, but that's a really good way of exploring. I would, I, I'm sure you could get somewhere interesting. What I was thinking of is just adding them one by one. 
But like, like, if you, there was a suggestion of all zeros and only add one, uh, and only one one, the zeros unfortunately are divisible by 10. Um, so, the, so you couldn't, you, we can't actually have any zeros, unfortunately. Um, so let's just try picking them one by one. Start out with one equals one. There's definitely no, nothing divisible by 10 there. One plus two equals three. I'm just gonna try adding some and see where, where it breaks, okay? One plus two plus three, that's equal to six, okay? One plus two plus three plus five is equal to 11. You can stop me whenever you want. Um, why didn't I pick four? Because that was gonna be equal to 10, I realized, I guess. I was like one plus two plus three equals four, that, that's bad. So let's do five at least, making it a little bit harder. It's just like add six now, because if I added five, it's like five plus five. I mean, there are so many ways you could do this. Like, it, it, like I'm just sort of writing out an example that's going to be hard. And yes, there already is a subset there, but I'm just gonna write out a full example. It's like a little bit harder than the previous one. So here, I'm just like adding some new, some new numbers so that we don't end up with anything that's like obviously equal to, to a multiple of 10. And yeah, there are different, you know, here, here we have all of the set and I've written it out. So yeah, we have one, three, and six. We have two, three, and five, and those all, both of those sum to 10. Is, is this like, is there any value here at all? Like, do you, do, you, do you see anything? I've just like written out a bunch of stuff. Do we see any patterns at all? Like anything that we can use that's not just sort of cherry picking some numbers. Common denominators, what do you mean by common denominators? Like try to find, uh, not sorry, not common denominators, just um, if we have 10, then all of the things, I forget what the term is, but the, the things that could be multiplied together to make 10 don't include any of them. Oh, them. yes, yes, so the, the like um, the prime factors. factors, yeah, sure. Um, we, could, we could look at prime factors with two and five, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to go there, but I mean, we could tr certainly, we could, we could certainly try doing that. Um, yep. Every number is equal to 10 plus, uh, 10 times something plus a remainder. Yes. Can we do anything with that? Now, all of these sums were clearly not divisible by 10. So that's a sort of a bummer. We can't make, we can't just say one of these sums is going to be divisible by 10. Um, is there anything else we can do? And clearly none of these ends in zero. Sort of a bummer that none of them ends in zero. Um, it'd be nice if, you know, all of them sum to a multiple of 10, you like, we could look at, you know, these remainders. You know, somebody, somebody brought up remainders. So this is like the remainder here is one and then three and then six and one and seven and four. Anything interesting there? None of them, none of them is zero. So we can't prove that one of them is zero. Where do we get these sets from? It's like two, three, and five. Two, three, and five. We have eight, one, and one. Any thoughts on how we can go about using that? Anything make those sets special? And like in the way that we've listed them out? I guess we shouldn't have added two, three, and five together. Some of some previous twos, yeah. So I mean, like, yeah, so th these were all consecutive. That's kind of interesting. So we started out with one, and then we added two, three, and five, and then we got 11. 
And here we started out with one, two, three, five, six, seven, and then we added eight, one, one. So we had 24, and then we had four, uh, 44. Here we had one, and then we had 11. Oh, yeah. So suggestion, the sum with the remainder of the previous sum. So what if we had like two sums with the same remainder? Then the difference is going to be divisible by 10. What would that mean if we had two sums of the same remainder, like 24 and 44? The additional elements, the ones that we added afterwards, yeah, they're going to have to form the set that we need, right? Like, like if there's 24 and we add some and we get 44, then the ones that we added have to be a multiple of 10. Huh. But is it always true that two of these are going to um, give you a multiple of 10? Sorry, uh, yeah, do we, will some of these partial sums always have the last digit, same last digit? Yeah, because we have 10 elements. So, ooh, wait, so let's go back here. We have 10, what, what are the things we have 10 of? trying to show that all of these, out of all of these sums, two of them have to have the same last digit. This is our going backwards. What would be, if we, if we could prove it, this would be really nice, it would make us happy. There are only 10 different remainders. Wait, but what, couldn't we have all of the, couldn't we have all of the remainders if there are 10 possible remainders? You know, zero, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh wait, there are nine possible remainders. Yeah, because we couldn't have zero. So if we're not allowed to have zero in any of these remainders, then we have to, there are nine possible remainders in 10 of these sums. Huh. So this is called, as somebody has pointed out in the chat, this is called the pigeonhole principle. And that's because if you have 10 pigeons and nine holes to put them in, then you're going to have two pigeons in the same hole. Like really, this is the name of mathematical theorem. It's really simple, it's really obvious, but it's super useful. So does this actually prove it? Are we done for 10 numbers? And 10 possible sum, 10, 10 sums, nine possible remainders, two of those remainders have to have the same last digit. That means that we can take the intermediate, the, 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 the intermediate numbers, sum them and get something to the like 10. So yeah, we're done for 10. And there is a suggestion we can do this by induction. I actually don't think we need induction. So for a thousand, you, can, you, can, you could do something with induction, but you can actually just use the same idea. So I'm just gonna walk through a formal proof of this now. And it will be pretty brief. Now, all of that thinking, and it's not easy to come up with the proof, but writing down the proof actually turns out to be pretty, pretty slick. So you can you define your terms. Let's let the thousand integers be a1, a2, all the way up to a1,000. We're not saying they're different. We're not making any assumption about what they are. So we were doing all these sums. So let's write down what those sums are formally. For k equals one through a thousand, let s sub k denote the sum of the first k integers. Sorry, the first, I guess I should have said the first k of these integers, so it's not clear. It's not, not the first k integers overall. Um, so s sub k is just equal to this. This is the formal way of writing that. So the first situation, we, yeah, exactly, 999 remainders. So how do we show we have 999? Well, we have to show that one is illegal. And it's not really illegal. We say, suppose that one is divisible by 1,000. In that case, we're done already. Now. Suppose that it isn't. Otherwise, there are only 999 possible remainders for the 1,000 different SK when they're divided by 1,000. By the pigeonhole principle, since there are 1,000 possible, 1,000 ones of these SK and only 999 possible remainders, there must be some two that have the same remainder. And notice I'm defining my terms again, saying what J, the S sub J and S sub K. Now here's a, a, a bit of proof lingo. 
suppose without loss of generality. So this just basically means that there's a symmetry situation and you can be like, well, either J is less than K or K is less than J. I'm just gonna suppose without loss of generality that J is less than K. Sometimes you'll see this written W-L-O-G without even being spelled out. Sometimes it'll be suppose Wolog that J is less than K. This is a useful term that you should know. So it'll be, you know, just since I picked J and K to be, you know, they, can, they can be anything, I just switched the names J and K. So suppose without loss of generality, then 1000 is gonna to have to divide the difference between them because they have the same remainder. But this difference can just be written as this sum from J plus one all the way up to K. And that's why I was assuming J is less than K so I could write it like this. Otherwise this would have to be negative and weird. This gives us the desired subset. And then we can write our little end of proof symbol. That's a fast proof of this, which is completely formal and rigorous. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Next time, we're gonna do the thing that was mentioned a lot in the chat, proof techniques, starting out with induction. And then we'll talk about contradiction and monovariance and other techniques for a proof. If you thought some of this stuff was uh, overly fast, or we went through, th through some things in a bit of a compressed way, I encourage you to go back to the slides and take a look at that or just stick around and ask some questions. Okay, unless you wanna ask questions, we're done for today. Why the question? Why does a thousand have to divide the difference? Really good question. So if two things have the same remainder, then their difference, it's the same remainder with respect to a thousand, then their difference is going to have to be divisible by a thousand. This is in general true for, for numbers. And I realize that I'm sort of assuming a bit of number theory here. We're not in general going to be assuming that you know any number theory. So don't, don't worry, like I'll, it, please keep on asking if I'm making an assumption of something that, the, 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 you know, since I'm a mathematician, I can sometimes get carried away with math. So make sure that I don't do that. Thank you for keeping me honest. Um, if you have two numbers, a and B that have the same remainder when divided by C. What that means is that A is some multiple of C plus that remainder and B is some multiple of C plus that remainder. That means if you take the difference, I realize I would, if I were, had a blackboard, I would just write it out. If you take the difference, you're taking the difference of B and A, that's just, remember B is some multiple of C plus the remainder and A is some multiple of C plus the remainder. So the difference between B and A is just some multiple of C minus some multiple of C because the remainders cancel out. And so you end up with something that's a multiple of C. In this case, C is equal to a thousand. Hopefully that helps a bit. If it didn't, then I would suggest you write it out and see. Great. So if we're doing this for a set of uh, question, if we're doing this for a set of K, we're proving it for multiples of, of N, is this, this is true as long as two to the K is greater than or equal to n. So this is a stronger statement. Since we have two to the k distinct subsets, um, that is not in fact true. Because, so here, here is an example why that is not true. Suppose, even though you have two to the k distinct subsets, they might all, not all have different values. Suppose that your, all of your elements were one. You're not going to, if all of your integers are one, you need all 1,000 of them. You can't do this with just 999 because every possible subset is going to be a sum of ones. So if you take a subset of size one, then you have one. If you have a subset of size two, you have two. If you don't have a thousand ones, you can't do it with fewer than a thousand ones. So this is actually tight. Any more questions? not expecting you to have been able to come up with a, a proof like this. This is to just sort of explain how you would go about solving a harder problem and then writing up the proof of it. You may not have overlapping sets. If one set is the subset of another, so applying pigeonhole principle wouldn't really help you. Yeah, so that's, you couldn't apply pigeonhole principle in the case that was outlined in the previous question. 
Um, in this case, we can apply pigeonhole principle because we've defined our steps in a very specific way. So one includes the other. Yeah, exactly. Any more questions? Okay. Have a great weekend, everyone. We will uh, come back not on Monday, because Monday is a holiday in Canada. We will come back on Wednesday with induction.